Have you ever wondered, can you communicate directly with spirit guides, teachers, or non-physical consciousness, or even our higher selves? What would they tell us? My name is Kevin Moore, and since 2015, I started to practice a form of communication which is termed channeling. I have been interviewing experts on my talk show to find out, does life continue after we die? And can we communicate with those that have crossed over? With each expert I spoke to, they all had different ideas. Is there knowledge from the past which could be shared with the present moment? So I thought, why not just speak to the non-physical world directly through channelers around the world? And that's what I set out to do. They call us channelers will take the viewers on a journey into the phenomena known as channeling. And my main goal with this docu-series is to bring a new understanding and awareness to channeling by looking within ourselves and asking, is it truly possible that we can all use this innate ability? My name is Sandra Sneed. I'm a source communicator, soul reader, and God scribe. Uh, my mother ran off with the Moonies when I was two. That was the mantra I used to say before I ever met my mother, um, that she left our family when I was two years old to become part of Reverend Sung Young Moon's uh, cult before they were legitimized as a religion. They were considered a cult. And this was 1967 when that occurred. So I grew up without a mother. Um, and my father mostly raising my brother and I with a myriad of stepmothers as well. Probably the earliest memory now that makes sense regarding my ability would be when I was four years old. I remember they had taken away all of my writing utensils and coloring utensils and so on. I guess I, I probably was uh, writing all over things, but when they had taken them all away, for some reason, I went into the bookshelf and I pulled out this red Bible and I started to draw on the wall inside the closet with this red Bible. Um, kind of a foreshadowing for my life when I was a God scribe in secret for seven years before I actually went public with it. Um, but childhood was, you know, my father was a mechanic. I always say my, my mother was a Mooney and my father a mechanic. Um, and it was hard. It was tough. We, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. It was a real struggle. And, um, uh, well, with regard to gifts in the family, I do remember my grandfather uh, saying that he could see spirits. And I remember my grandmother saying, I don't see no spirits. Um, and he used to like candles in the garage when he would work in the garage to keep away evil spirits. And he was uh, a quarter Native American uh, Neosho Indian. And then I guess you could say my mother, even though she wasn't around, uh, she did experience, when I did meet her later on in life, she told me that she had a spiritual awakening when I was born, that uh, I had been this like lump of clay in the doctor's arms. The doctor was holding me in his arms like this, and then he went like that to get me to cry, I guess. And my mother saw my spirit enter my body. I, like I went, <gasps> and, and when I entered my body as an infant, my mother had, that's when she had a spiritual awakening. And that's what led her on her path. And Reverend Moon had come to town and 
Um, that's what captivated her spiritually. And I, I did later find out that she would do psychic readings and, and that sort of thing, but she had long put that away when, when I finally met her. You know, I don't really remember a whole lot about this voice being there, except for one time I distinctly remember it was a Easter egg hunting uh, kind of a contest. Uh, I think the local church was putting on, and I remember being probably about seven years old, and uh, it was a, and I remember the Easter egg hunt, you, you know, those plastic eggs, plastic eggs that opened up and um, all the kids scattered. But I remember kind of being guided or hearing a voice telling me where to find it. And the, the egg that I found when I opened it, I had won a bunny, uh, not a, you know, a stuffed bunny, a stuffed rabbit, but I was so excited and I can recall being guided to that like it was a gift given to me by i would say god now but i but then i didn't know i didn't know what it was but that bunny i i cherished it for that for that reason that it was like a gift that i was guided to open now a couple of years ago although i didn't know this growing up uh, but a couple of years ago, uh, when I was out doing my source talks, traveling around, my father had uh, told me that he and my mother, when they were together, went to a spiritualist church where there's mediumship in these spiritualist churches. And he remembered st standing up behind a podium and suddenly a voice started speaking through him, uh, which scared him. Uh, so he never went back to that church and he never talked about it again. And, and uh, it was the first time he had actually talked about it. And this was a couple of years ago after it, I'd already been out traveling the country doing source talks. So um, I had a hobby as a photographer in, oh, when I was about 20 years old, I had studied electronics because I thought that that's what I wanted to do was um, work in electronics. I, I, for some reason, this was 1986, and I was captivated by computers. And so I studied electronics, but um, programming class made me cry. So there's no crying in programming, I guess, but I, I had had a hobby as uh, taking photographs. And then uh, I, I met a young man who, who really liked my photographs and thought I should take it seriously and go to college. So I did. And photography is kind of a geek's art, you know, a gearhead lover's art. So I studied photography, photography at university in Kansas City, University of Missouri in Kansas City. And then I apprenticed under uh, very well-known photographers, uh, advertising and photographers at Hallmark. And then I shot meat processing equipment to make a living uh, as a photographer. And then also Hallmark Cards, which was based in Kansas City, my home t in my hometown. Um, but uh, I was pretty much starving um, at my art. so. About age 33, I decided I, I needed to leave my hometown, and that's when I moved to New York City to, um, you know, I was more an, an artist than a commercial photographer, and my portfolio actually led me uh, to an amazing career in New York City, uh, working for PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is a major accounting firm in New York City, and then I uh, worked as a creative designer for a media agency in New York. I was 39 when I had lost a job that I loved and a man I was in love with. And in New York City, you know, your, your whole social life uh, is usually wrapped around where you work. 
and then my personal life uh, with this man I was in love with. And when those two things disappeared at once, I suddenly found myself uh, very much alone and uh, started having panic attacks. And these panic attacks uh, were so debilitating, I really thought I was going to die. And I found, though, whenever I journaled, they would uh, simmer down. They, they would uh, not be as, as hard. So I would journal a lot. And one day, I had, I had already filled up a whole spiral notebook of my lament, of my unfortunate circumstances. And uh, one day, though, when uh, I had my pencil on the top line of a brand new spiral notebook, something came out of my pencil without my even noticing that it was moving. So when it stopped, I happened to look down and I saw unemployed. It is my assertion you are employed by me. And the idea that I was speaking to me or employed by myself or to myself, it was like taking the blue pill in the matrix. It was this mirror kind of opening up to the me and the I, and I became fascinated by what this is. So I would take dictation from this voice coming through my pen. Uh, ultimately, I, in a year of solitude, filled up 10 spiral notebooks, becoming completely reprogrammed uh, by what some might call a voice in my head. I knew that it was God, even though I was an atheist at the time when it started, I knew it was God just on how I felt it addressed me and how it addressed me. It wasn't addressing me as a, as a human to human or person to person. It was addressing me from a, a very high position, yet somehow within at the same time. And the overwhelming feeling of of peace and love and attention just on me. Like I am the only living human in the universe. This, this attention to me that this voice gave me, I knew it was God. I just knew. I think I'd, I was an atheist probably like many people who go through university uh, although I had spent some part of my, uh, in junior high and high school, living with a step-parent who was a born-again Christian, and so I learned, I went to vacation Bible school and um, Sunday morning, Sunday evening church, and sometimes on Wednesdays. So I became indoctrinated by Christianity, and um, so when I moved in with my father, who was not by any means religious, he was a pilot, a weekend pilot, so we would go flying on the weekends, and he would call that his religion. And that started to open me up to the idea that um, there's more to one's belief than religion. So when I went to college, and studied philosophy, it was through the ontological argument that I was able to frame what I thought God was, which would be the inconceivable, uh, that which is inconceivable. And that's what I began to accept as the non-existence of this male, masculine godhead in the sky. Uh, I think in the time that I was growing up, even professionally, the idea that God could be female seemed so... Uh, I'd rather throw out the concept of God entirely than to consider that thought. But I knew I could not have been made as a female by a male God. So I just threw out the concept entirely. My peer group was 
skeptical, uh, spiritual, but not religious, um, if they were at all spiritual, uh, it would be an, a non-identified spirituality, uh, but definitely, definitely atheist intellectuals. You know, we were we were intellectuals. When the when the vo voice really started to announce its presence in my notebooks, and I would ask it questions. You know, the kind of questions only an atheist would ask a God that suddenly showed up. Um, and when it answered those questions in a way that only the creator of the universe could know, then uh, I became fascinated by the content. And it was very hard to understand, by the way. This isn't, isn't stuff you can just scan and read and go, oh, okay, I get it. It's, it is a reorientation of the nature of all things and of the nature of this body we think we are. And perception started to go from the, instead of from the outside in, uh, from the inside out. And that changed or reoriented um, my entire existence or way that I even considered my entire existence. Yeah, definitely an internal, uh, um, a very intimate, you know, this, this, is, this is something that people don't consider when they think of the Bible. Uh, usually, or at least it's been my experience, where preachers who uh, are Bible-based they will read the Bible out loud with a very authoritative, dominating sound, um, booming, uh, a booming way of, of talking about God. But if you think about how much of the Bible came about through God scribes like myself, it's a very intimate act to, to communicate with a voice in your head and, and record it with a pen. It's very intimate, um, private, personal. It's like your own thoughts, but these thoughts go higher than you're thinking. So you're having a literal conversation. Um, Philip K. Dick talks about this. Uh, um, Carl Jung talked about this, the undiscovered self. So these are uh, just very intimate experiences. In fact, um, for the first three months, in my solitude, I would uh, take dictation and, and uh, fill up a number of, of pages, many, many pages in a notebook, and then I'd put the pen down and I'd walk back upstairs and forget, you know, forget about the voice, forget about what was written. I'd go back into my panic states and I would worry and fret and or do whatever. And then one day, um, it was raining outside, and it was that green color. You know, sometimes in spring rains, the, there's this green cast to everything. So was, the air was really electric. And I went downstairs, as had become my habit, to begin to write. And the first thing that came out was, I do not end with this pen. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't, what do you mean? I do not end with this pen. And I still didn't quite understand what was being said. And then finally it said it again, I do not end with this pen. And there was this huge light that just lit up the whole house. And then this uh, a huge, th it was a uh, lightning strike out in the backyard, and it had knocked the top of the walnut tree to the ground. I do not end with this pen. And I went running upstairs, just, ah, 
ah, scared, scared to death because it's one thing to experience God in the intimacy of, you know, privacy of your own journal and then to know God's in the backyard. You know, it's a completely different experience altogether. So that's when I started to develop um, the, the internal voice. Uh, giving God internal voice into my head and allowed God to show me visions uh, and that sort of thing. So how this kind of uh, evolved over time, uh, this had occurred, my year of solitude was in 2004. Uh, When I came out of solitude, I had to go back to work. I'd gone through my life savings. I'd gone through my severance. I'd gone through my unemployment. Um, So I had to get back to work, uh, which was really hard because I had kind of lost that fire in my belly. I wasn't ready to to go and pound the pavement, Um, but I did my best. And and a girlfriend of mine who she had just had her third child and she didn't want to be a stay-at-home mom. She wanted to go back to work. She said, will you come come on down to Houston and uh, play nanny for us, come and live with us, and, and, to, and just start over in Houston, and at least until we get a real nanny. Um, and that was a very healing experience, to be around small children where their needs were so basic. All they needed was um, to be fed, uh, to be bathed, to read stories, nothing complex, just basic needs. And that was a very healing experience. And within three days, actually, of moving to Houston, Houston, I met my husband um, and fell in love and got married. And he had a son of his own. So we, I instantly had a a family and a very normal life. Um, But about 2011, Um, And I continued these conversations with God uh, in the privacy of my own notebooks. It was my relationship with God. But but a woman came to my house one day, and I told her my experience, what had happened. She said, Sandra, people need to know about this. People will want confirmation of their own experiences. You really need to write a book. This really needs to be in a book. So that's when I sat down to write uh, What to Do When You're Dead, A Former Atheist Interviews the Source of Infinite Being. And uh, when I finally found a publisher, which happened to be, I'm so happy about this, uh, Neil Donald Walsh's publisher in 1995, who who published Conversations with God, uh, published my manuscript. But I knew that once that came out, I had to start speaking. And I was working, uh, my day job was as a writer uh, for Fortune 100 companies in the oil and gas industry in uh, Houston. So um, when my book came out in uh, late 2013, I knew I had to come out with it. So that's when I started to go from scribing, God scribing, to um, training myself verbal transliteration, which uh, is really what my form of channeling really is. It's verbal transliteration. That's, that's where I, I say I allow the being we call God to speak through me. But I think of God as this great wave of vibration that's in every cell of the universe. So when I take dictation, it's really more uh, my pencil writing in resonance to the vibration of the language, kind of like Thomas Edison's wax cylinders and the, the megaphone into the, onto the needle and then that vibration records uh, the voice. Um, that's how it feels to me when I scribed. And so I needed to figure out how to deliver this information to people um, because I was doing soul readings by writing them, scribing them. 
uh, but it just took too long. So I needed a way to give them the information faster. So I started to train that vibration to, to move up through my vocal cords, through my solar plexus, uh, and uh, my throat and mouth and jaw. And it took about two years for that to really be perfected. And, um, and that's really when my source talks started to take off. And I would make trips out to California uh, to do source talks. And God would pick a topic. Still does this, by the way. Uh, God picks a topic, and then uh, I show up and let God speak through me on that topic. And, and these are amazing talks, by the way. Uh, some of the titles are um, The Word That Signaled Time, Tyrants of the Mind, The Nature of True Love in Three Parts, The Trouble with Men, The Trouble with Women. Uh, these are incredible hour to two hour talks uh, that teach the nature of the soul, the nature of spirit, the nature of the mind, and how in control we really are, but we don't realize it. So, so much, so meaty in there. My understanding of God now is very personal, even though what I mean is a personal relationship. I'm in constant communion with God, and that's taken a lot of years to be able to do that where it's a constant communication. You know, it would be uh, once a month, and then it would be once a week, and then once a day, uh, and then all day long. And I, that literally took years to remember God uh, because God's easy to forget when we get caught up in the mundane tasks or what people need from us in our job. Um, how, our, how we relate to one another, because I certainly don't bring God into my conversations with my husband unless it's critical that we, you know, that we tune in to get information. But that's a, my husband and I are a human relationship. So it's a very private, personal dialogue with a voice in my head. You know, I think my work is different from other channelers uh, because I'm tapping into the source connection and, and I believe that uh, there are so many different channelers that are, that are either telepathically or um, they are, it, it, what God has told me is what, as to what channeling is, is um, someone is allowing an entity to communicate either through or to um, using their auric field. And God not being an entity per se, God is in every cell of the universe, so you can't really channel that. I allow, that's what I call it, is allowing. And it is the matter of letting, letting go of identity my identity and allowing uh, the greater identity to come forth and to speak uh, speak what is so. It's a drawing. It draws that information through me. When, and I think anyone who works in the source field uh, would say it's a drawing through you. Even my name indicates that. It's Sandra, which is the so in draw. Uh, draws what is so. Um, so I think what's what's different about my work is only in that I'm working with source intelligence, universal source intelligence. Uh, and there have been many God scribes like myself all throughout history. Moses was one. Uh, we've Mary Baker Eddy who founded Christian Science in 1875, Neil Donald Walsh, who published Conversations with God in 1995. So I, I, I recognize uh, the content and syntax 
that God uses uh, through a God scribe. So I think those are all very similar. You can tell a God scribe. I think the evolution of my work, I hoped the evolution of my work, I would really like to have a syndicated column, ask source column. Uh, right now I have a column with Texas Weddings Magazine um, where I am a true love spiritual advisor and I really love that work. I love bringing to the magazine uh, true love. You know, wedding, wedding magazines tend to be about uh, the dress, the flowers, um, what, what a bride wants, and it's often very unigender, it's, it's for females, uh, but I get to bring to the industry the real meaning of a wedding, matrimony, which is true love. And in this next issue, for instance, God wrote the article, um, the title of it is The Spiritual Wedding Planner, or The Spirit Spiritual Wedding Planner, and it was 12 things that to make sure of in your wedding, and uh, really beautiful content, beautiful, amazing content. So, so where do I see this evolving? I, I really see this information going mainstream, just as mediumship has gone mainstream, now healing has gone mainstream. Uh, I, I really would like to see uh, the work of God writing through me, God speaking through me, as being something that seems perfectly natural. There are hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people who hear this voice inside them. And if they only hear it just a little bit, and then they hear me or read uh, my work and say, I know this voice. I can hear this voice. I know those words. I know who's speaking. They can develop a deeper, uh, more profound relationship with that voice. And where will it take them? That's where I'd like to see my work, how I'd like to see my work evolve. What are, what are all the explosive uh, potentials in every master I can awaken in the course of my work? Um, you know, I think also what's really important to the evolution of my work is that, you know, when, like when people read my book, What to Do When You're Dead, um, my hope is when they read God's words and they hear their own voice in that reading, they can get closer to what God is inside them because it's going to be their voice that they hear, not some uh, booming masculine <laughs> male um, authoritative figure. It's going to be a whisper and it's going to sound like their own voice. And the only way to tell the difference is that it's the highest thought and it's the most peaceful way. And it's always a perfect compromise in any conflict. It's the way of being honest, this voice, this highest voice. And I think in this book and then the next book is going to be about uh, love and relationships, love's highway. I'm really looking forward to the completion of that book because uh, if I can help people fall in love, what a great mission, what a great mission to have, helping people fall in love. Is everything God? God says the, the everything is the uh, conundrum here because uh, humans don't really understand what everything is. 
humans think of everything they can see, smell, taste, touch, feel, hear. They don't notice what they can't see, smell, taste, touch, hear. So in the way that uh, God is all, uh, that's so much more than humans comprehend. There is an all in every blank space. In every blank space, there is an all. In every blank space, there is an all. And what blank spaces are we talking about? In between the, the sub-molecules of an atom or something? Or, or even, even between uh, you and Sandra now, the blank space between the two of you there is, an is all. filled with an all. So, mm. in, in other words, um, the condition of God that is God is a condition that identifies what God is. In that, there are things that God is not, meaning uh, things that man makes without God, for instance. Uh, that would be about all that is not God, is that which man makes without God. Um, in that condition, it's a very small percentage of even human experience. But God has given us iPads. God has given us iPhones, for example, the technology. God has not given iPads and iPhones. This is man's technology, what man has made. The difference between what God has made and what man has made is that uh, God identifies the all in all that is made. Man identifies the uh, brief need, which is now. Man never considers a hundred years, 150 years for anything man makes. Man makes things to last five years, 10 years at the most. Yeah, but, mm, but I would have thought if I, you know, I would have thought that God gave uh, someone the idea or the inspiration for the technology we have now. That is true. God gives inspiration, indeed. And when an inventor asks God uh, how to solve a problem, God gives the answers to solve that problem. And that results in technology. But God didn't make the iPad. So, why and how is Sandra able to communicate directly to God? Sandra's architecture, meaning her body, was maneuvered through a, a, a messenger's doorway. So the messenger's doorway requires a certain architecture. So she was bred, in other words, and bred through generations. And that breeding of a messenger um, is, is relatively common. But what's uncommon is when an individual matures to be a messenger. The maturity of a messenger depends on a whole host of variables that can get in the way. We could have traumatized her to such a degree in her childhood that she could never overcome it enough to be individual. She would always have to be um, in need of, of someone to keep her company. If she hadn't learned how to understand isolation and solitude as the doorway to God, and she just stayed in her misery and depression, well, we would have lost the opportunity. Are we, if I wanted to communicate with God, does that have to be in my life's purpose to do that? No, no. God is in, is in you. God is in uh, your cells. 
God is in your mind. God is your mind. But there are uh, many minds that are in your mind. As long as you ground yourself in your highest thought, your highest order, you will be guided to what is your destiny. And your destiny isn't always about what God is through you, but what God is for you. So if, if God is the conduit for you to channel another entity, then God is the way you ground yourself in order to channel that entity without fear. If God is the doorway for you to feel um, at home in someone else's experience, which is what you would have to experience in the knowing that you know. Do you understand that? Okay. So when the other channelers that I've met are bringing through other uh, names, other entities, other groups, of the, other collectives. Is that not a part of God that's coming through? What is different to what they channel collectively or non-collectively compared to the, uh, the, this that's coming through now? Most channels, if they are in the uh, higher vibrations, are... Uh, are so because they know God. So they, they, they swim in God in order to relate the information that they are brought here to relate. Um, Sandra is a God source channel because she refuses anyone else. All others scare her, make her feel like she's surrounded by things she can't see. And so uh, to keep her calm, she would uh, identify, God, is that you? And we would say, no, put the pen down. She'd say, God, is that you? And we'd say, yes, keep writing. So she uh, nurtured that state because it was the only state she would trust. But others can be a little more trusting because they were designed to trust the others. So, in, in that, if I was to sum up what that what, what was coming through there, in a sense, it, it's just different flavors and aspects of, of a bigger soup, in a sense. It's, right. Yeah, with different flavors in a soup, it's all part of the soup. God is the soup? Yes. And the flavors within the soup are the many potential entities that either will communicate with or are communicated with. Tastes different to some, but contain aspects of that information as well. For different reasons. All reasons have something to do with man's evolution. This happens to be a period of time where um, coordinates are aligning now for channelers to wake up. It's just all aligning now. Uh, but that'll all disalign in, in an amount of time when uh, skeptics and fundamentalist religious piety starts to overwhelm uh, the channels and they become ridiculed to such a degree that they're forced back into the closet. That'll happen. How many people out there are actually bringing in this information. How many others out there are connected to God in this way, would you say, channeling God in this way? Many, 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 but very few actually say that's what they're doing. Some of our favorite preachers actually channel us. Uh, some, some of our favorite um, poets channel us. Mm. Some of our favorite artists channel us but they don't call themselves a God scribe or a source communicator. But we are very present with them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've met, I've met you in different ways all throughout my journey. I keep meeting you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's beautiful to meet you again. Um, I 
I almost want to ask you to do something different here in a sense. Uh, first of all, what, is, what was the agreement with you and Sandra for her to do this work? She wanted to know what she could do for love. That the people she listened to when she was in the world of love, before her vessel was born, she could only report. She could only report what uh, people were wanting, what they missed, what they needed. She could never do anything on the side of spirit. So we said, if it is true that you will do, then what you will do will have to come from us directly, or you won't be able to do for us directly. And she knew the consequences of that. She had seen many before who had been either burned or crucified or uh, maligned or, or ruined for what they claimed. So she came in quite afraid. That's really what spurred her atheism, was a fear of knowing God. But was there any sort of, it almost seems like that she had a walk in, it almost, or there's some, something happened to her at a certain age for this to come through. What really happened to her at that age when this was decided upon to come through? Well, all that she had worked for, all that she believed herself to be, suddenly disappeared as if it had no meaning. And if it didn't mean anything, what was all the work for? Mm -hmm. So when it all disappeared and she was left to see what she is, that's when she awoke to us. What she is, is the so in draw, draws what is so. This thing has happened to her her whole life. We have come through her her whole life. And she never knew why people called her weird. But it was because we were speaking through her when she wasn't paying attention. Has she done this in other lives? No. No. She's been an entrepreneur in other lives. She's been uh, a successful businessman, a, um, a, a rallying, a rallying grace. What is a rallying grace? A queen? I've been a queen? Well, they don't want me to know. <laughs> they don't want me to know about that. I mean, it would just be too, I don't need to know whether I was or wasn't. Speaking to Source directly here, what is the difference between a channeler or a psychic medium in the sense of, you know, a, a psychical medium will connect with those that may, you know, potentially have crossed over, but what, what does a channeler do that's different in the sense of a reading? Well, a channeler is a medium, uh, but they can be a medium to something other than a human without a body. So they can channel a, a being nature. Maybe uh, they channel the essences, or they can uh, be a channel to some archangelic nature. some ghost of a past, some great spirit like the, the human spirit, or even something as profoundly enormous as a, as a Christ, or, or, or even Yeshua, or Jesus, or um, Moses. Right. So the channeler is just the medium expanded. Yes, and it, so it's bringing in expanded information from the grander scale of things. Right. Rather than the singularity of someone that's just crossed over and the perspective of even when, where they're at, because they may have crossed over, but do they know anything much more different to what they knew when they were incarnated on this level, where those wiser beings that have been on, in that 
realm, energy, whatever you want to call it for a longer time. I'm probably not using the best of words here, but they have a much more expanded ism about them and sort of teaching information that comes with that. And the, the way that the channeler is able to be a medium to that is that their true self is there where the entity resides. Their true self is still there. So they are communicating through the vehicle from that space. They're altering their consciousness in order to work from the consciousness of their true self. Oh, oh, right. Yes, so they're tr they're, they're tuning in to a, that tr that higher aspect of themselves, the, the God aspect, in a sense, the yes. expanded version. Yes. Is that the same as the higher self? Yes, yes, and and you said it just right. It is the God self, one's own God self. Because we are gods having a human experience. Yes, yes. Why are gods having a human experience for? God's always having an experience, whether it's human or some other animal or a plant or a cloud. The experience God is having is about the awakening to what is God. So um, only a being that becomes self-aware and identifies itself by seeing God in itself is God aware of God's self. Was it not aware be prior to this? God is aware where God is aware. Where God is not aware is just a being that has not become aware of God. So we give ourselves this challenge of being here with all the forget-me-nots of disconnection from the God that we are, our true understanding of this is this this the we are we are the everything we are the all the one the everything yeah uh, to have this experience so we can't you know so when we start talking about punishments and wrongs and rights none of that really is true because we would only be punishing ourselves in that case there is no external god the god is within absolutely when when one wrongs someone. One is wronging oneself. But the effect of the wrong on oneself is not an effect until they are self-aware. In other words, self just gets spilled out all over the place until self-awareness contains self. That's when the experience of all I do is, is done to me becomes a conscious effort to bring to me what is good to me. But it seems so real on this experience here right now that Sandra is separate from me and I am separate from Sandra. It's really difficult to, to really say that I am her, she is me because of my lack of truth to my truth to the understanding that I came from somewhere, I'm going to go back to it, the, the somewhere that I speak about is you that I'm speaking to, you are me, this is God coming through, I am you, you are me. I can't remember the space I came from 100%, I can imagine it, but I can't really say I remember, remember it. It's just a lack of training. E even Sandra is unable to blend with you in such a way that she sees herself looking back at her from your eyes. But when she is in, which she is now, in you and you inside her, she's become so sensitive that there, there is a feeling that there is no separation. But to be able to see herself through your eyes takes a dimension that you're actually trained, uh, unconsciously trained to be able to do. So when I look into your eyes, I'm looking into God. 
because I'm, well, I could say when I look into your eyes, or when someone looks into my eyes, we're looking into our soul, God. Soul is just a word for a human word for what this isness, this I am is. Well, we would correct you in that soul is an actual organ. So there's, there's a spirit, which is the origin of all life, is in, in its spirit form. And then spirit devised an organ that allowed spirit to manipulate matter because spirit cannot inhabit matter all by itself or it would blow it up. So there's like a step down organ, the soul. And within spirit and soul, there is the body. So you are surrounded by your spirit and soul that is put together all of these cells to make this vessel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, the, the connection between individuals is through the soul because the soul is the feeler organ. It identifies feeling and, and what it seeks is joy. When it cannot find joy, it is forlorn. It only seeks joy. It, it, it needs joy. Are we living in joy in our life? Sondra in her life, my, me and my life, are we living in joy? You are looking for joy wherever you can find it, and you show such gratitude when you do. And that is the best anyone can do. When you experience joy, you are so grateful. Learning how to make joy out of the mundane is just a matter of mastering. Mastering thought, mastering perception. If you're having a bad day, you either accept that today I'm just going to have a bad day and I'm going to enjoy this bad day because I choose this bad day. Because we create our reality? Because you decide. You Is could decide not to have a bad day. You could decide to turn it around to be a joyous day, just as a matter of perspective and change. I just wish sometimes in my life that, that things were manifested quicker. It seems to take so long sometimes, and you're like, oh, come on. Just a few changes here right now, guys. Just a few changes. We create our reality. I know we do. We create our reality. But it's never, you know, even if when you do come from love from any decision, it's never kind of like, come on, now, now. In this reality, it's not that instant, is it? It's, it takes time. In a sense, there is a way to make it experienced as now. But we know what you mean. What you mean is to go from idea to the manifest of that idea has so many steps in the process and there are so many undefined variables that you, you can't identify in the imagining. You can only identify when you're bumped up against it. Right. And then that prolongs the amount of time for completion. Um, but when it comes to the now, you can hold each moment in the process as a completion in itself and feel the joy of that sense of completion. Mm. And sometimes we have good and bad days, don't we? Sometimes, you know, we go back to our old ways of thinking that there's not enough, I'm not good enough. Um, my life's not going the way I want, I'm pissed off with everything. And it's hard to rescue ourselves from that place sometimes. You know, with all the people that I've interviewed on all my shows and everything else, I don't, I don't know if it, I mean, I know my truth is that, that I, I am, a, a, this is a, a spacesuit in a sense, my best analogy for it, to let me have this experience. It is, uh, it still can be difficult. It's tough. Well, the, yes, yes, in a word, yes, of course it's tough because you're in 3D and your, 
your spirit is used to being able to move with every thought and go wherever it wishes in every thought. It can't really affect much uh, in, in its uh, capacity to move wherever it wishes in a moment of a wish. So now that you're in, in a construct of matter, you are forced to move in, in uh, two legs. You're forced to make with two hands rather than an experience in the imagination is the experience. So it feels heavy and hard because of the, the dimension you're in to make it happen. Some of the best times that I had was when I was just imagining my life, when I was just playing in my mind, just playing in my mind of the, the reality that wasn't there, but I was playing in my mind that it was. Just play, just like what kids do. Just, yeah, imagining a life that wasn't in my current perception, but yet in my brain it was. And imagination in my worst times was my escapism to that which was well, just a better place than where I was at sometimes. You said it exactly, escape. To be present in your life, to move your life in a state of presence, expands the soul because you are in full, rich connection to the event. In your imagination, as you escaped into that, you did nothing. You had no effort to reward. But in your effort now, there are rewards. Few though they may seem. Mm. The reward is in the effort. Mm. Okay. Okay. You will see on the other side, you will one day see when you have left this earth how incredibly important all of the efforts you are making now have as an impact in spirit. Well, that's interesting, actually. That's going to lead us to our next discussion, actually. Um, yes, that which you do here is affecting you. Your growth is our growth. Your growth is our growth. Right. So, what we do here now um, now, let's just get this right as well. Anything you're going to tell me has got to come from me. You are not going to give me your truth unless I ask for it. We give the truth. Yes, but I mean, if you were to sit and start blabbering out stuff without me asking you, I don't think that's going to happen. I think I've got to, I think you're full of such information of such high level that it would blow my mind. But well... We could only describe uh, what you would be willing to hear. That's right. So there's nothing forced upon us. Right. It's up to me to bring to ask you. It always is with the channeled information. You have to ask and then you receive. And people say to me, why is that? I'm like, well, maybe it's called free will, where it's not forced upon you. That is indeed it. Indeed it. It's also about readiness. Your questions indicate readiness. The kinds of questions you ask indicate readiness. When we do readings with Sandra, we are blind to someone's readiness, so we will ask them questions, and determining the, the answer they give, that tells us their minds, preparation for receipt. So, how many... Uh, I, I'm fascinated by the multidimensional universe and how that plays into this. It, are other, I've asked this to other channels, but are other multidimensional universes affecting our present moment? Absolutely. You're in constant battle with alternate resonances. You may think you're having a bad day and not know that what's affecting that day is a resonance from some other individual you're going to meet in two weeks and the wave that's coming off of that future can be battling your current 
making everything really hard. Just rewind that. So something, if we were, for, as an example, meeting someone in, the, in a future date, that's resonating into this, pro what, 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 what if that meeting was positive? Are you, is that as an example of the meeting was negative? No, not necessarily. Sometimes the meeting is uh, somehow altering, whether it's financially altering or uh, professionally altering or personally altering, it's altering some course. The future is altering some course in this present moment now. It's attempting to alter the present moment because it's, in a sense, aligning you to it. And, and if it's a powerful enough future event where it literally alters your course, it can have a wave that, that goes all the way to the present and you, you are fighting that resonance by staying present. How do you, how, how would you, you can't cure. Relieve that, relieve that. So you would uh, uh, soften that bombardment of, of future resonant uh, conflict by changing the thought from uh, I'm having a bad day to uh, I'm not feeling well right now. I'm going to give myself five minutes of feeling badly. And then at the end of those five minutes, I am going to feel better. So you relieve the tension between the altering course and the present condition. It's just giving it room to vibrate through. How close could that future event be that's causing that issue now? Could it be a day away, days away, weeks away? Months, even. Months. What you're doing now may be preparing for um, some decision that will be made months from now. Because that's happening now, that future event's happening now. Right, because you are preparing for that. You may not know exactly what you're preparing for. You're just aligning the coordinates that will get you there. You may not be aware of where there is. And as they're doing what they're doing in that moment in the future, that's energy, that, 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 that's changing something here. So that could be going really well, <laughs> for example. It could be a positive right. thing. Yeah. But where you're at right now, uh, you need to make the changes more, more hastily to, 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 to something's rippling backwards to make those changes even better for the future. So, but so it's almost like, is, is it energy coming back? Is it some sort of energy coming back into the past? They're waves. 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 Con conscious waves? They are vibrational waves. Uh, if you imagine um, a, a smooth, placid lake and uh, a drops of water in the lake and, and, they, and they are concentric rings that then meet up right. together. In order for them to resonate, co-resonate uh, in a way that um, changes or alters the course in a direction you consciously want, you've got to relieve the tension of the present in order to open to the flow of that future. Is that what I've been going through today when I feel so low for Absolutely. no reason? Absolutely, why we brought it up, exactly. You, you are fighting so hard to uh, complete the process, not knowing that you're completing the process. Your, your every step is establishing a future event that you have no idea is going to be the future event. But it's already happening now. Yes. With free will to change it as well. Because of what you're doing now. Also, alternate futures are waiting in the wings. And if you continue to have a bad day after bad day after bad day, and you lose the uh, course of your conviction for this project, then they might be the future 
condition that's resonating with that bad day. Do you so I, I do, I do, I do. So let's go to some of these alternate. Let's just talk about some of the alternate universes, um, in a sense. So. <laughs> um, Does God have alternate versions of itself in the alternate, alternate universes? Or is there one source, if we could think of it like this, one source of God that overlooks the whole of the alternate universes? Or is there all alternate yous as well? There is a foundation of origin. And the foundation of origin is inalterable. Cannot, cannot be altered. It, it is as it is and always shall be. But in that is that always shall be, there are uh, f uh, frayed conditions of the, of the wave, frayed conditions of the wave, which can be the course of, of any individual's uh, life. When you align to that which is God within you, and you are unified in that field, it's the unified field from the origin that you become in the course of God that is you, inalterable, because you become part of the um, tractor beam that holds you steady. So are we able to communicate to these alternate versions of ourselves? There's no need to. There's no need to. You can have uh, God. How am I going to put that in words? God, God's showing me these really this cool picture. Like every thought, every thought you're having in the present has a has a, a ghosted image. So there's the real image. And then there's these ghosted images. And as you, as you move your present in alignment with Source, the real image, even though all these other ghosted images are possible, the real image is the true Course. And the more sensitive you become to the true Course and the true reflection of yourself, um, the more these altern alternates seem small, insignificant, um, what, what gets, unenlightened. What, what gets you there? Is it coming from love from your decisions, loving your decisions? No. Uh, going with love for, your, for what, what your calling is? The, the truth gets you there. The truth gets you there. Being sensitive to what is true, discovering what is true. Is that what you love? Is that, is that, is that the things that you would love to do or the, th or the situations that you have in the present moment you would love to explore? And, and, and You have to love yourself. It's true that you have to love yourself enough to identify the true. Because if you don't love yourself, you're in a state of untrue. When you don't love yourself, you are untrue to you. You are disavowing you. What's true to yourself is, is would that be, okay, if I'm going to be true to myself, I know where, where, where I might like to live and I'm going to be true and, and, and go with that truth, even uh, go with bravery, go, go with something that's, that's what I should be doing. Regardless whether I've got the money to do it or not, or not to be silly with it, but regardless, go with what feels right. Feel first, think second. It depends on what you're feeling with. And, and this is the part of true that people confuse. Um, gut feeling can be affected by condition, right? This doesn't feel quite right to do this. Is it because you're afraid that it doesn't feel right? Or it doesn't feel right because not all the uh, ducks are in a row yet? Yes. 
So you have to identify what is your feeling telling you about not right. It may not be no, it may be do this first, do this first, do this first. But that, to, to, to simplify that knowing, so, so if we're going to live our lives to the fullest, right, and we want to, we, we just want to, you know, keep it simple, if there is such a thing, right, then, so you're saying, is it gut feeling or not we go with, or is it just, that we, we just know sometimes, like how do you explain we just know what's right for us, yet we don't do it because we're scared shitless? Right, so the true, when you just know, that means it's true. It holds all the tests of true. And if it wasn't, it turned out to be it wasn't, at least we were true to ourselves to see it through. Right, right. So, you, if, if it didn't turn out the way you planned, it could mean that your reason for being there wasn't about the plan. But it held you steady to get that far. Right. Are we able to tap into, we say that those future um, re realities are, or a future aspect of ourself or a future event, sorry, that's going to happen is rippling with waveforms to now. That's sometimes why we feel, you know, that we're having a hard time. Can it also ripple through to the good feelings as well? So some, we, we, we're just feeling overjoyed, we're, we're just doing this on this path and we just know it's so great. Is that rippling through from future decisions as well? Um, what, what tends to occur in states of overwhelming joy um, is a, a congratulatory experience. One has achieved through effort and in that effort been rewarded. So um, the, the future is in that now of all the past it took to get there. Uh, the only time we say um, to fix a bad day, the reason we say that is because you could be, and more often than not are, working in conflict with a wave in the future. How do you heal that wave? I, I think I want to go, but how do you heal that? How, if, if that is happening, something, and you take that, that break, What's going to heal yourself so that you are uh, in a better alignment with what that wave's trying to tell you? The, the main thing it's trying to tell you when you get a sense of conflict, when everything seems really hard, is to, to identify the thoughts um, that are, are making you feel this small. There's something inside your thinking that's making you feel this small. One time, Sandra had spent a day where she just watched TV all day and she couldn't motivate herself to do anything. This was before her book was written. And then she said to us at the end of the day, in her guilt for having spent that day that way, will I always be mediocre? And we told her, yes. And this upset her. Really? I'll always be mediocre? And we said, but that is a beautiful word. It means the golden mean. And, and it, it meant, uh, back in the ancient days, the, the golden mean is that you don't build too high on the mountain or you'll freeze, too low in the valley or you'll flood. It's right in the golden mean, the middle way. In the middle way. So finding the middle way in what you're doing diminishes the extreme view of something so small. You're forgetting all of your past achievements. And it diminishes, I suppose, trying to reach too high and setting a level that's so high that you're not in that, that middle ground neither. Right. You're not, you're not putting yourself in the boat and letting God flow you. Does God flow us? When you allow it. What, 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 what helps us to allow God to flow us? Surrender. To the present moment. Surrender each fear, each worry, each insignificant feeling, feeling insignificant. Surrender that. Each panic. 
um, each assuredness uh, that everything's going terribly. Yes. Surrender that. Well, do we have a life plan? Or is the, or is, is, is there, with free will, is, do we have a life plan with free will? So there's things planned out, people we're going to meet, but there's still free will for what we do with it. Or is it even bigger than is that? Is there destiny? Yes, mm. there is destiny. Uh, destiny is what your soul planned with either your guides or with God or um, with the angels or whomever you've chosen to enlist to plan out what your next lifetime is going to look like. Um, then when you enter this lifetime and you forget all that was planned, you're already set up to uh, head down a course, but then there are things that could interrupt that course. But that course is so strong, you can overcome those interruptions. Now, free will is when uh, you change your mind. Yes. And, and we never suggest that. It could stick you here, get you stuck here. Changing your mind. Changing your mind. Constantly. What, well, no, changing your mind from the original plan, the original destiny. Um, you planned it. How, with do, how do we change our mind then? Sorry, I don't mean, how do we change our mind? If, if, if something's destined, when we, when we say change our mind, do we do that consciously? Well, the world has pro will program you to believe something to be true when it isn't really true. It's just a way to keep you as a child in line. So your parents will program you with information and then the world outside of your parents will program you with information all about how to survive in this world. None of which is absolute truth. It's just, here's how we survived. Here's, here's what you can do in order to survive too. But it doesn't have to um, change your mind about the course of the life you are to lead. You have to be true to this part of you. It's the story of Rudolph and the red-nosed reindeer is a perfect uh, allegory to this. Uh, an elf that wants to be a dentist was programmed to be an elf. Every, all the elves work for Santa and all the elves make toys. That's what elves do. But I want to be a dentist, said one little elf. And he was drawn and yearned and he was made to feel an outcast and, and uh, stupid and wrong for, for wanting this. But instead of being programmed by all the other elves, he set his own course. He exacted his free will based on what his urge to be was. But that urge is always changing for me. You know, what, you know it, just, it just feels like it's always changing and it's like, is that really helping me? Your urge doesn't change. Your urge stays the same. What changes are the techniques that you use to facilitate that urge. And maybe you have certain destiny changes that are related to the skills or tools you use, but it's all the same urge. You are a messenger. I so you, you have learned the tools of messengering technology. All messengers have utilized the latest technology of their day in order to get their message out. I wish, I suppose, my ego wishes that it could reach more sometimes and have a bigger platform, but... And so many wish they could reach as many as you do now. I don't think of it like that. I think of it the opposite, that I'm not doing good enough, or... Well, I'm not doing good enough, but I'm, I'm not... I've, it's, I can't reach... The, the, that level of getting bigger is just unreachable. It just seems to just flatten and plateau out, but... I guess that's not, none of that's true. Um, it doesn't stop you, does it? Even though that feeling of a flattening out kind of overwhelms you and makes you feel it what's it all me. for? It upsets me. 
it upsets me to, to, to think, well, why is it, you know, you put so much into it, why is it not breaking? Well, the breakthroughs have to come when the audience is ready, as much as when the messenger is ready. There are certain uh, changes that are going to have to go on within your way of seeing yourself. If we wanted to change our reality right now, is a quick pathway to that or a way that we've not been trying before is it to communicate to our future aspects of ourselves the future aspects where we really want to get to so if I want a TV network or not a TV network but if I wanted to you know have something right that I really wanted to get to right could I in okay if I wanted to produce online TV shows could I find, could I tune in through meditation to a future aspect of myself that's achieved that and bring in information of how to do that in the moment now or things that I need to change in this moment now that that future aspects has already reached? In a way, yes. Uh, what we suggest you do is to start imagining yourself in that place and speaking of yourself as already in that place. So. Um, I am an on-air personality. I am a television uh, producer. Um, uh, I am searching for my next network to be a part of. So that you, instead of saying what you will be, you are stating what you already are, only getting better at. So you change the dynamic of um, how you see yourself it naturally changes the course or the speed with which you um, achieve that which you are designing. But through meditation, could I imagine that I'm speaking to myself from that future perspective and actually asking it questions of how I could improve this process to get there by, by, by asking it, you know, not hacks, right? But is a, could there be a communication you could set up with it and say, how did I get there? What, what, what do I need to do now? Or what's the one thing you could tell me that would help me to help you more? Because are you, by helping the future part of you, are you helping the uh, present moment part of you? We love your question. What, what we have to clarify, though, is you are your future self. The idea of going into meditation and having a dialogue with um, you uh, two years from now mm. uh, in order to tell you today how to get to you two years from now um, assumes that in two years from now you know where the hell you'll be two years from now. <laughs> You don't. So you've got to be who you want to be right now and start acknowledging yourself in that way. I already am that. God, that's like saying that that future aspect of you is no wiser than you are now. That's, that's exactly what you just said. No, it's just a blank there. And the more you blank that out, um, the more you improve uh, what two years from now will look like. But if you try to envision two years from now in order to get information um, for your present self, you could be uh, making your, your scope of, of fruition this big when it needs to be this big. Is that because all we have is now? Right. You, you have so many limitations as to how you see yourself. Well, could a parallel version of ourselves be more, could, could, could there be a parallel life that we're living that's already achieved that which we're trying to achieve now? In a sense, it has. Because in spirit, if, if this is a life that was written in the book of life, for instance, if this is your destiny, yes. um, then it has already occurred in spirit. Could we communicate with that aspect of us? Very much so. So not a future, but a parallel reality version of ourselves. Well... It's more the spirit version of you. 
Well, that's confusing. <laughs> well, it's confusing because you haven't imagined that your spirit is already making uh, what it is you wish to be. So our higher self, oh, this oversoul, this spirit energy that we are, that we can communicate back to, that has already achieved that which we're looking to be. Right. From the... It has already achieved that which you are wishing to be. So it always goes back to spirit. Mm -hmm. It always goes back to the source, the godness that we are, to communicate with that side. What would that side say to me? Okay, if I wanted to do something, I don't want to give too much of an example here because I, I want it to be kind of generic for people, but it would give us something that would help us in the moment now to achieve that which is already achieved, something that only what it would tell us with free will would help us in this moment now, help itself in a sense. Your spirit would say, Kevin, we were made for TV. We, we were made for it. And they're showing me this really cool thing in your name. The V in your name is like voltage. And there's like, like a Tesla voltage coming off of that. I'm liking it. And that's like a, that's the broadcast voltage. <laughs> But that's what, you, what your V in your name means. For victory as means. well. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, but... The voltage. Like the bunny ears of a, of a TV, the old-fashioned antenna of a TV. <laughs> that's what your... Um, uh, they said... They say... They say um, who is this they you're wanting me to tap into? Kevin's band... Band of angels or something? No, um, band of spirits. Uh, there's a whole um, band uh, working on your behalf to make this so. So, um, okay. So they're saying they're saying we made you. full of voltage. We made you full of voltage. Okay. And, and? There's nothing more to say. We made you full Like, like, like Broadcast. you are, yeah, Broadcast but. signals or something. Right, well, well, like, yeah, 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 yeah. As the broadcaster. Yeah, that's what I'm picking up from what you're saying. Right. Hmm. Okay. Like it's like I see you and uh, up in spirit. I see you and this band of merry men, um, uh, like making you, like designing you. We made you full of voltage. So we can. So that's an example of tapping into your soul, spirit and showing what can come through. So if I had tapped into myself and trusted it, that, that would have come through. And not a direct, as in like, this is what you've got to do, but something just to lift you up. Yes. To say, this is your path anyway. Get on with it, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we can all tap into that space. We would say, and this is your band of merry men again, um, we would say, be patient, but don't sit but don't sit, be patient, but don't sit. No, be patient, but don't see it as patience. Okay, be patient, but don't see it as patience. See it as holding energy. Holding energy, like a capacitor kind of thing? Yes. see it, don't see it as patience. Like holding, holding, holding. When it seems slow or unproductive, imagine holding energy. 
like it's building up. It's building up. The lags in time are building up. That uh, was what you were saying earlier on about the futures rippling in and this energy that you're feeling, I've been feeling for years, is because of something from that future that's coming in that's quite big maybe. Mm -hmm. that's, you're feeling, yeah. In conflict, you're feeling in conflict All with the time. this very... Mm. You don't mm. realize how much what you're doing in the present is affecting this future that's coming, constantly flowing towards you. It's like you're working here and it's affecting here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. And we, we're all doing that, aren't we, in a sense? God says, yes, but some more than others. And, and you are one of those who is affecting here. Um, here is what needs changing, not you. So as you are working here and this is changing, this is opening for you. So timing, uh, being in the right place at the right time, uh, needs you to keep the effort. As you keep the effort, um, the, the, the opening doorway from these two aligning it gets you right there. Hmm. Hmm. So he's, if he's patient, sitting still, being patient, you're holding, you're holding the potential you're holding the potential of what's being created here as you work here. Your patience. Oh, I'm a little confused by that, but it, it's, some, it's a capacitor though. It has to do with, I, in photography, we used to use strobes and these flash strobes, you know, they would, to charge up, they would charge yes. up and then you'd flash them. Yes. And they'd have to charge back up again. Well, then let me ask you this. What does that tell you about the nature of our reality then? What would God say there if I asked that? That it's fluid. It's fluid. Fluid. It almost feels like this nature of reality to me is, and this seems so egotistic to say this, but it's not, I don't mean in this. It's like, I feel like I'm in the Truman Show sometimes where all this is my reality made for me by something else, but just for me. Yes. For me to have woken up. But then I think it's egotistic to say it because well, everyone else would experience that perspective as well. So it's all made for, I'm made and you're, we're all made for them to wake up. Well, let's say your activities are fulfilling your awakening. And in your awakening, you are activitying, you are making activities that affect another and then affect another's awakening. You're just doing what it is that you would do in your awakening, not knowing the effect of your awakening is awakening another. So you could say that uh, you are doing this for them. Well, that's true. You are, are you not? Though it is for you, it is really that you do for them. Uh, yes and no. Otherwise, why would you have a documentary that thousands of people could watch? You would just make it for yourself. Of, 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 of course, but it's almost like it's my awakening. Well, it's like it's my challenging to myself or my awakening, but then I'm, maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it is more for others, but it seems to... I, I don't know what it's turned into be, to you be honest. You were born to be a messenger. A messenger's job is not only to gather the message, it's to distribute the message.
Why does a messenger distribute the message? In order for those who need the message to receive it. What is the most important message right now that they need to receive watching this? The most important message for your audience who will hear this is that the awakening of this time, of this age, is awakening for the purpose of saving humankind until and unless humans decide otherwise. Saving them from their own destruction. Because they're in the course of it. They are in the course of their own destruction. Why have we chosen that path? It was not consciously chosen. And that's how it happens. When you are unconscious, just going about doing what you're programmed to do by a world that programs humans to do what it wants them to, not any concern for the future, just all about what's happening right in this moment. And in that concern of what's happening right at this moment, there is no long-term view of what could happen or will happen to the future. And even if there is a long-term view, it won't affect me in my life. I'll be dead before then, so why should I care? That is the way we think. So in that way that you think, you create for yourself a path of destruction, self-destruction. You cannot survive in that, in that frame of mind. You're on a planet that's millions of years old, that's been through millions and millions of, of iterations of evolution long before humans ever set foot on the planet. So until we start coming from oneness and seeing that we're all one, the calmness that will bring the love to, more love to the planet, which will sustain us for eons to come, will not arrive unless we find within us the oneness between us all, this, the, the, that we are all one. In a way, in a way, and ultimately that's true, uh, but between here and there, um, it has to do uh, with the nature of understanding organic life. Organic life is very fragile. And there are so many variables that are necessary to sustain it. And, and none of those variables are being adhered to. The only things that are being adhere, adhered to is what is necessary right now, right this minute. You mean the destruction of planet Earth? The misuse of... No, the destruction of, or, of the organic layer that sustains human life and, and all other life on it. What would that be for someone like me? That What do you mean by that? Uh, the biosphere. The biosphere is being wiped out. Uh, the destruction of, of forests, not just the rainforest, but the destructions of, of forests as a whole, the damming of rivers, all of the systems of nature that s supply it with its own organic layer being wiped out. Could we solve this as a species? Can, can humans solve it in the mind that they are in right now? No. What would be the right mind to solve that from, or a better mind to solve that from? Fear of death. So our fear of death is the cause of these issues. No. Man is not afraid enough of dying as a species. Okay. What, what would be the ramifications of us dying as a species? Because, I mean, the soul will just be able to have an experience somewhere else if it chooses to do. Unfortunately, if millions of, of humans, vessels, uh, pass before souls actualize, self-actualize, 
uh, they can become trapped in the, in the realm of the void of the forlorn. So the souls of those who do not know they are souls, who do not know their own spirit, uh, can become as obsessed and trapped by the trappings of the world as they are right now. All of those holiday shoppers, shopping, shop, 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 shopping, weekend, you don't have any idea what else to do as a hobby, but shop, 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 shop. Buy, 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 buy. Forest thrown down, uh, lands, uh, farms destroyed by um, corporations that, that yes. uh, uh, kill everything in its path. Kill everything in its path. So we would only uh, probably reincarnate into other places where we'll just do the same. Well, if there are too few humans left to help prey all these uh, sad souls into the realm of spirit, then they just become folded into and, and annihilated by uh, the evolution of the planet. But... Is that fair? Because we are, we are gods. It's not a judgment. We are gods. That, no, absolutely. But we are gods having a, a godly experience on here. And we have had to blank ourselves from our true nature of who we are by having this experience on planet Earth. It's almost like a paradox. Let's say a child pulls down a boiling pot off the stove. Would we say, but it's not the child's fault that he accidentally burned himself to death. And it's sad that that, that child burned themselves to death, and it's not fair that the child burned themselves to death. It depends if the parent was, you know, had, had they allowed that child with with their own, you know, not knowing that the child had entered that room where the pan fell, you know, was the, was the parent looking after them at the time? Well, let's assume that the parent was, uh, went to, to answer the doorbell. The FedEx package came. That's all she did. Just a moment, from... A momentary a, blip, yep. yep. A moment, so many moments before, yes. never had been a problem. Yeah. And in that, in that singular moment... Well, that's no one's fault, not the, nor the child's fault, nor, nor the parent's fault. No one's to blame. And that's how humans are with organic life. They are children. With Dangerous. No well, we're, so you're saying God's gone to answer the front door for the FedEx package, or we've gone to answer, some part of us has... God cannot save man from himself. How will man ever evolve? If he's but is saved. it man, or is it man? Is it the soul inside the man? Is it the human? Is it the soul having the human experience? Is it God having a human experience? Well, this this is definitely something that people misunderstand about human responsibility. There are so few who actually set this system up for their own interests. That's true. Just a very few of them set this up for their own interests. But then these base emotions like envy, um, coveting thy neighbor's wife, or um, uh, wanting what others have instead of what you already have and being grateful, all of these very fundamental, yes. soul-expanding states of joy uh, are not taught anywhere. So all the sheep follow the sheep because the ones who are with their own interests are guiding this for their own interest. That's where free will is lost. You can't break free from that which is guiding your interest. You have no soul invested. It's very interesting, you know, I, I'm doing a documentary to what I thought I was to, to show the phenomena of channeling, yes, 
Um, I know it's going to be much more than that, but just at its basics, you know, what is channeling. Yet this is talking about saving the human race. Yes. Yet where does that come into my ideas of creating content for showing just the continuation of the soul? Well... You, you don't understand and humans don't understand the soul can be lost and many souls are lost. Am I a lost soul? No. Is a lost soul someone that's not awakened? A lost soul is someone who is caught up in the obsessions of life and believe that that is the way of life. But even though we're told that this may be a holographic universe, that what we think is real may not be so real as we think, if some of that's true, some aspects of this is a hot, this is not what we think it is, why does destruction and all that really matter? I mean, I, I'm not here to hurt anyone, but why does any of that matter if this was some sort of computer simulation at its core? I'm not saying it is, but what if, this, if this is not what we think it is, why does it matter? The soul doesn't know what it is without a body unless it knows what it is without a body. So when the body passes and the soul remains, if it doesn't know what's beyond, it can trap itself looking for its body because it wakes up alive. It's still alive. When it's crossed. No, when the body's gone. Yes. Is that the same as crossing when the body's Crossing is when it finds its spirit or when, when it unites with spirit and it is on the other side. Isn't that what we do all the time though? When we cross, when, when someone passes, it reunites with its... They don't always do. Sometimes they remain a wandering soul. Until? A medium sees them, helps to release them. But if, if there was a massive self-destruction or there was a massive degradation of the Earth's atmosphere and stuff, obviously, you know... Are you, or the, the, sickness. Or, si or sickness. You're saying that... Well, I guess you're saying what you've just said previously. <laughs> the soul can get trapped looking for the life that it thought it was. It thought it was a body. For the majority of people, I can understand that because they don't look into these subjects. Right. But what? But but even it, okay. Someone that's crossed over just yesterday that wasn't looking into these subjects is crossed. She he's crossed over. Don't they just go back to this reality where you're from? Some do. Many don't. Okay. They paid no attention to their soul. Did it matter? It's what's left after the body died. Maybe some people are just so switched off that um, they're switched off in that sense because it's the experience they're giving to the people around them. That's what I always thought. You know, it's not because they're just switched off and they're lost, but it's the experience they give to the people in their families around them to be switched off. They, they say, hey, guess what? I'll be switched off, you be switched on. And, you know, even just to have that experience between each other. Are you trying to say that it's in their destiny that they uh, become a wandering soul? Even on planet Earth, while they're here? We can tell you that that is not a place any soul would want to be. So you're telling me those that are not into anything, that are in denial of everything, haven't actually chosen to be in denial of everything. They actually came here to re-remember who they were. Well, you're asking a lot of questions at once, not yes. knowing that you're asking a lot of questions at once. Um, we're talking about those who have not self-actualized. Which is the majority? They have not, right. They have not questioned who they are or what they are. Did they plan to question it before they came down here? Some did. Yes. But then some didn't. Forgot. They forgot. forgot. Okay. It's easy to forget spirit, to get caught up in the obsessions of the world, to be caught up in sexual obsession, in shopping obsession, in um, 
Okay. Uh, trying to measure up and. Uh, okay. Children are obsessed. They go to they go to public school, and uh, the, what's what's popular or trending um, becomes yeah. an obsession of the kids, and they yeah. think. Um, there's something wrong with me that I don't have all the things that uh, Buffy and Kin have. But but oh. that to me is just an expression of coming down here and having not remembering your true connection of who you are. Right. But then it whose can carry fault, on into adulthood. Whose fault is that? That's our fault for choosing to come down here. But it's not our fault. No, it's a, it's not. It's not the fault of anyone. It's the consequence. But we must have known that consequence before we came here. No, not necessarily. So we came You know here. the risk. You it know was a the risk. risk. But it, but we, what, but There's then, always that risk. But then surely if we've lived other lives, we would have known what would have happened in the other lives, that the, the consequence was that we would forget. Well. No, knowing what we know from other lives, couldn't, wouldn't that have saved us in this one? Maybe not to do it again, <laughs> but for free will. We just wanted to go down that, that slippery slide again, straight down the... On the Have you ever done anything really scary, and then when it was all done and you were safe and sound and everything was okay, you wanted to do it again? Mm. Yes. Well, that's kind of what reincarnation is. God damn it. Mm. And each time you risk the loss of your soul, and you gamble the expans expansion of your soul. You're gambling on the expansion of your soul. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Welcome. That makes a lot of sense. <sighs> wow, that's a, that's a lot of stuff there. Um, okay, okay. Then, does the world need a new type of truth? Is there a new type of religion going to be born? Unfortunately, we wish messengers were able to be taken at face value and not worshipped. But messengers are often either maligned or worshipped. We hope that whatever religious organization starts to form, um, that it comes from philosophy and not from spirituality. Philosophy opens doors to thought that religion closes doors to thought. Philosophy questions thought. Religion uh, discourages questions and thought. What, what if channeling, in its broadest terms, could be brought to a higher level, like a more, will channeling in the future become more, will it become more recognized? It will be recognized as a way of understanding consciousness. And it will hold consciousness accountable to the information. So truth will have to demonstrate some kind of principle to be accepted. The question is, what type of judges do we determine to uh, evaluate and justify certain content? Meaning, if you, have, if you have an alien telepath and this alien appears to be benevolent, but in actuality has an agenda, there's a certain principle of judges that need to determine whether that information can be distributed or if it needs to come with a, a warning. Well, what if I, what am I setting up in terms of a foundation for channels then? You are allowing the conversation to take place. So the foundation you're laying right now is for the distribution 
of uh, altered consciousness, the distribution of altered consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a new Bible in many ways, modern Bible. So tell me about my new Bible. So we want to tell you a story. It won't be a long one. Once upon a time in a land far away, there was an Egyptian goddess whose name was Isis. And she carried through her legacy a failure to be. And in her failure to be, all those who were to come after her failed too. And the legacy she left behind has no future, nor even in this time, any present. So instead of uh, becoming a new Isis in, human, in the human world, there were humans who dug up the old Isis and tried to reveal her through her failures. And in doing so, reconstructed a history of Isis that was untrue. Had no bearing on history or mankind. It was a misinterpretation of a being that failed to be, making it as if it succeeded to be. So the reason that that all occurred was there was no Bible to allow uh, truth to be reiterated. There were other texts that have been reiterated through messengers since, and new Bibles have been created. But we're going into a, a time of technology in the future of humanity that could lead to humanity going off planet. So there needs to be something that goes off planet with humanity. And that's what your work in this foundation is for. Mm. Sandra saying, wow, cool. God's talked about humans having gone, gotten off planet before, but that's the first I've heard that there's a chance our, that humans from here to a future could get off planet. And I saw, what I saw was this channeling works being in the archives somehow, the digital archives, what the digital library. digital library. Because they wouldn't be able to just take, you know, paper volumes of books. We want you to imagine the possibility that if this does become a dogma, there will be a failure in your destiny. It must become a philosophy. Hmm. It must be the way people explore consciousness, not spirituality. Spirituality cannot be achieved through channeling. Spirituality is achieved through self-awareness, self-actualization, self-identity. But if people are channeling 
before they understand the nature of that philosophy, they could lose identity, distort identity. So you must become spiritually awakened first before that will take place. Self-aware. Self-aware. What am I? Who am I? Do people channel without that awareness? Oh, yes. And they get lost. They get so lost. How could a soul, why would a soul channel without that awareness? Well, the human becomes fascinated with the information. Human becomes fascinated with knowledge. Knowledge that comes from somewhere other than their own thoughts or their own reading or study. But most channels that I know do not want to say to the peers that they're people, you know, don't be, you know, this is only my truth, make up your own. Well, then they have no principle for what truth is. Well, we all have an individual truth, don't we? We have individual experience. And in individual experience, we see what reality is on a level of what is revealed through our experience. But truth lies somewhere within even that. But then we all take a different truth back home with us when we cross over. All truth that is true remains true no matter what true others think true is. But do we create a reality where we make up our own truth? It doesn't last very long if it's not true. But you'll only know that once you've gone back home. You just get hit by a two by four here and there. You're awakened somehow. But then people are spreading their untruths all over the place then and, may, and doing very well for me. Which it. is why it must remain philosophy. The warp and distortion that can occur in the course of humans attempting to channel or be a telepath because this becomes popular or something interesting, uh, must be identified as philosophical. Does Sandra identify as philosophical? Sandra identifies with self. And, and what is in the self for her is her state, which is the God. She doesn't even trust her own thoughts, meaning she will uh, play with an idea, someone will ask a question, and it'll sound interesting what she says, but then she'll ask us and we'll say, no, that's not it, that's, that's not it at all, and she'll be corrected. <laughs> but she knows where to go. But where does philosophy fit into that idea then? Philosophy, is the embodiment of a condition of thought, some condition of thought. And, and ancient Greek philosophies um, and philosophers all settled around this way to think, which is consciousness is beyond what I think. There's a universe within my own consciousness. Okay, so you would say it has to be a philosophy for channeling. It has Not to be. a religion yeah. or spirituality. Spirituality is something completely different. Spirituality has become a religion. Yes. And it's becoming one in its own way. There's always been cycles of that, spiritualism. So present it as a philosophy with the channelers. Well, find your teacher in a sense. Which, find your teacher. Which teacher do you resonate with? Which teacher teaches you? We all resonate, meaning we all right. beings resonate. But which teacher teaches you? Which teacher teaches you? And in that question, you can ask yourself, which teacher is teaching me? And you might find the one that is teaching you is one that is the wrong teacher to teach. So long as you are always asking 
you will always find truth. But there may be one of the channels out there that really resonates with you. Well, not resonates, but that, that you're like, she, he's the one I want to work with right now. Until he, she... We would say the word agree. Agree. I like that. I, I agree with that one. Right. My soul agrees with it. Right. Well, my mind agrees with that oh, right now. That my right now. my experience agrees with that yeah. right now. Till it, I wish to form a new right. understanding or truth. Right. Or until what they say say means something different to me. I become my own teacher in the end. Yes. Okay. I become my own teacher in the end. That is exactly why it must remain a philosophy. Well, I thank you very, very much. An honor and a pleasure. This is Sandra saying, Kevin, thank you for your wonderful questions. I, I always learn when people ask really awesome questions. It's been deep. Mm. Thank you. <laughs>